Colossians chapter 4, 4 verse 17. I'm speaking on the subject, fulfilling your ministry. And say to Archippus, heed to the ministry in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Hallelujah. Now the book of Colossians was written by Apostle Paul. He wrote the letter to the Colossians, the church at Colossae. When he wrote the letter, now this is how he concluded the letter. He was concluding his writing and he said, and say. Now he was addressing the whole church. The whole church. Then before he, con- he concluded the whole letter, he said, and say to Archippus. Obviously he wasn't a pastor of the church, but he was a member of the church. You see, he wasn't occupying, he wasn't a pastor of the church or anything. He was just a member of the church. But Paul addressed him. And Paul allowed the letter to be read publicly and for his name to be mentioned. And he was addressed so that he would take heed to his ministry to fulfill it. Now, who is this man, Archippus? His name is mentioned twice in the Bible. His name is mentioned in Colossians 4 verse 17. Then in Philemon 1 verse 2. Archippus. Who is Archippus? Now, Archippus was a son of Philemon. The book of Philemon. Philemon is in the Bible. It's before the book of Hebrews. That had a son, and the name of his son was called Archippus. Actually, his son's name was Archippus, and his wife's name was Aphia. I'm sure if he was, she, she was to be a Ghanaian, she would have been called Aphia. <laughs> The Colossian church or the church at Colossae was located in the house of Philemon. In those days, we had, there were house churches or household churches. And the Colossian church was actually in the house of Philemon. That was where the church began. And Philemon had a Christian family. His son was Archippus, his wife was Aphia, and they were all within the church that was in their house. According to history, the pastor of the, of the church was Epiphras. You've heard of Epiphras before? In Colossians 4 verse 12, Epiphras was a pastor of the church. And Philemon was a very, a very wealthy man because he was a slave master. Now when you read the book of Philemon, you realize that there was a certain slave by name Onesimus who actually became a runaway slave. Then Paul met him, and Paul converted him and sent him back to his master's house. Actually, he became an active member of the church at Colossae, because his name is mentioned in the book of Colossians. Yeah. So the whole family, obviously Archippus was born into a Christian family. You know, into a Christian family, Christian household, and that is where the church was. And Paul now addresses him and say to Archippus. Now, what Paul said, we can draw four things out of what Paul said, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. You know, according to this verse, number one, we have received a ministry. Number two, our ministry is in the Lord. Number three, we must take heed to our ministry. And number four, we must fulfill our ministry. That's what I'll be talking about tonight. We have received a ministry. Our ministry is in the Lord. We must take heed to the ministry. Thirdly and fourthly, we must fulfill it. Fulfill the ministry. Firstly, we have received a ministry. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received. We have received a ministry. Now you must understand that ministry ought to be received. You see, concerning ministry, you have to receive it. You have to know what it means to receive or how to receive ministry. Ministry ought to be received. Many of us have not received our ministries. But before this meeting ends, tomorrow you will receive your ministry. The Lord already showed us that he was going to give so many things to you before we came. So obviously, God is going to 
show you what he has given you. But how is the ministry received? Now, ministry ought to be received. Do you remember that Paul said that, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. Paul said he received the ministry. Ministry ought to be received. God has a ministry for every one of us here, but not all of us here have received our ministries. But how do you receive your ministry? You don't receive your ministry from a Bible school. Going to a Bible school doesn't qualify you to receive a ministry. Reading books and learning from books doesn't qualify you to receive a ministry. The knowledge you have acquired from many books is not what your ministry doesn't lie there. What constitutes your ministry is your personal and your special experience with Christ. Ministry is not received by assumptions and by speculations and by any kind of undertakings. In fact, the Bible tells us that and when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd. You know what Jesus said to disciples? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then Jesus said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What constitutes your ministry? What constitutes your, your ministry is not even perceiving a need. A need. It's, it's not even in the perception of a need. Of course, as part of discovering your ministry, you first perceive a need. But perceiving the need or the edge of opportunity is not even your ministry. Jesus is saying that if you see a need, if you see the field, if you see how men are fainting and scattering, and your heart is moved with compassion on them, instead of going to them, that's not the first step. Don't go to them. First, pray that the Lord will send you. Because if you don't pray, so the first response Jesus gave is, pray ye therefore. You have seen the harvest. You have seen the need. But instead of just enlisting yourself to embark on the project, he said, no, first pray. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send you. Because if you don't pray and you, you just take the step, you have made yourself the Lord of the harvest. Because God is the Lord of the harvest and he has his, he has his administration. Where to place you and where to place me. So prayer is a necessity when it comes to this stuff. Pray ye therefore. Now you must remember. I want you to beat your chest and say, I have a ministry. I have a ministry. Say, I have a ministry. I have a ministry. And I'm here to receive the ministry. In God's eternal mind, in God's administrative mind, in God's deliberate intention, every one of us has a ministry. He has given every one of us a ministry. But we don't know it. Beloved, when we were saved, we were organically saved. When we were saved, we were not just saved independently. Lord Jesus, I receive into my life. Of course, that is true. But something happened the instant you, you pray that kind of prayer. You were not just individually saved by receiving Christ into your heart. It happened, but something also happened. Because the Bible said that for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. And we are all made to drink into that one spirit. For as the body is one, and the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. What it means is that the instant a man is born again, like an organic transplant, he is organically transplanted into Christ to become a living member of his living body. When we call that organic salvation, you are saved organically, you are brought into his body to become a living organic member, to partake of his life, and to relate to the rest of the body. From that time, you have a dependent life to depend on one another and to depend on the head. You see, now look at your body. Every part, every member of your body is functioning. Your livers are functioning. Your intestines are functioning. Your sinews, your ligaments, your bands, your joints, your fingers, your ears. 
every aspect part of you is, is effectually functioning. That's how we must see the body of Christ. In as much as you have been transplanted and have, have been baptized into the body to become a member of Christ's body, it means that automatically you are brought into a place to function in ministry. You see, if you were baptized to become the ear, it means automatically you must hear for the body. If you became the eye, automatically you must see for the body. If you became the mouth, automatically you must speak for the body. If you became the leg, automatically you must, you must walk for the body. By all means, in as much as you have professed the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are now a living member of his body and you have been tempered. The, God has tempered the body together and has set you at a place to function as a living body must do. So if you are here and you don't know your ministry, just consider how the body is suffering. Because you are a member of the body and you have decided not to execute your function. If the, the ear decides not to hear, it will affect the rest of the body. Because the ear doesn't hear for the ear, the eyes doesn't see for the eyes, the eye sees for the body, the leg doesn't work for the leg, the leg works for the body. What you are doing is not for you, what you are doing is for the body and for Christ. So, beloved, if you are here and you have not yet discovered your ministry, you, it is a necessity. In fact, you cannot do without it. You must fulfill the ministry. You must see it, receive it, and fulfill it. And I know why the body of Christ has a, some few functional problems. It's because of you. While the other part and members are effectually functioning, you have decided to not to function. I want to show you how deadly it is. So that you can be ashamed of yourself. If you want to be ashamed of yourself, turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Before we read, in those days, when the church was born, the first century of the church, the way the church was is quite different from how the church is today. A lot of things have changed. In those days, when the early church, actually, presently, our calling is not to even compare ourselves with the early church. We should have gone far beyond the early church because that was just a threshold. But now we have not even come to the measure of the stature of the early church. By the time it's coming, the body of Christ that the early church will not even be a reference. It will just be the birthplace and the threshold. We would have gone far beyond it. But you see, in the early church, everyone who was born again was automatically in ministry. That's how it was. Ministry was not the exclusive reserve of some few elect. There's a way they understood ministry. Because when we say ministry, what we think of is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, papacy, mamacy, akpop. But, but let me show you. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, whom the Bible said he was a man full of faith. And he worked miracles among them. Look at Acts chapter 7. Stephen was a glorious preacher. Before the Sanhedrin, which was the official supreme court of the Hebrews, he stood among the 71 member Sanhedrin, member council, he stood and preached the whole Bible and summarized the whole Bible. Hmm. And Stephen, Stephen was a deacon. In proper terms, he was a Daniel Hall officer, according to Acts chapter 6. Yeah, he was a Daniel Hall officer in the church. They were part of those who were selected to oversee tables. Whilst Peter and those people were in the fivefold ministry and they gave themselves to the word and prayer continually. But Stephen was part of the seven elect that were taken to save tables. And they saw that as a ministry. And even in that, look at what he accomplished. Philip was among. Philip was the first person in the New Testament to be translated. He was translated from Azotus to Gaza and met the Ethiopian Enoch and preached to him. There was a mighty move of God in Samaria. And Philip left Samaria and the Holy Ghost took him to meet one man. This is how the ministry is. God take you from a whole congregation to meet one individual. <laughs> That's how dynamic the ministry is. There are people who, are, who love crowds. The Holy Ghost says, move. Say, I will never move. <laughs> move, I will never move. <laughs> from a whole congregation, he left the move of God. There was a mighty revival, a revival in Samaria. 
such that people were burning their books. People were being converted. Those in the occult, they were being converted through his preaching. The Holy Ghost took him to meet one man, Ethiopian Enoch. And years later, when the missionaries went to, came to Africa, you know, they realized that the gospel was already in Africa. Yeah, but it had not developed. And they traced it back to the Ethiopian Enoch. So whilst meeting one person, he was meeting a whole continent. <laughs> but Philip was a deacon. What about Phoebe? In Romans 16 verse 1, the Bible said that he was a servant of the church that was in St. Korea. The Bible said he was a servant of the church. There's a ministry like that. What about Ananias? When Saul of Tarsus was caught as a red-handed rebel on the way to Damascus, and when God knocked him down by lightning, <laughs> I thought Jesus would send Apostle Peter to minister unto the coming Apostle Paul to the Gentiles in truth and verity. But he sent an ordinary disciple who went and laid hands on him and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. So, in the New Testament, Jesus used ordinary people who were used in ministry. But somewhere along the line, in the second century, there was a mistake in doctrine. There, there was a genuine saint of God, anointed of God. He was a father of the church. By name Ignatius. In fact, he was the one who invented or who brought the word Christianity. He was a father of the faith. A father of the faith. But in his writing, he brought some distinction. And there was a kind of a little theological imbalance with his writing. And the next generation took it up. And something happened in the church. There was a division in the church. And two terms were introduced into the church. The laity and the clergy. The laity and the clergy. So, so what happened was that the church was divided into what is called the clergy caste system. Where those who had to minister the priestly service were those who were specially ordained to do so. And the rest were laymen. Those who were not specialized. The case became so worsened that people couldn't even pray for themselves. Because they believed that they were, their prayer wasn't holy enough. They have to see the pastor. The clergy caste system clerical system, the priestly system, the pastoral system. They couldn't even believe in their own prayers. They had to see the pastor before they believed their prayers could be answered. It went worse, and the church entered into dark ages. But in our day, there's going to be a restoration. You see, God is not seeking to use few people. He, he seeks to use the whole body. Because if your whole body must be effectual, every member of your body must play a role before your body can be healthy. That's God's intention. And Jesus wrote to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and in Revelation 2 verse 6 he said, this thou, also, this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which thing I also hate. You see, the Nicolaitans which I also hate. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now the word Nicolaitan is from two words. Nikos and Laos. Laos means laymen or ordinary people. Nikos means above. So, Nicolaitanism actually means to be above the ordinary people or to conquer the lay people. So that you, we subdue their ministry and we make them ordinary people. So we will just, they all look to us for us to do the, do the ministry. For us to have placed them aside. Jesus said that and I hate and when it came to the church at Pergamos, it had not only become a deed, it had become a doctrine. For that church, Jesus said, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Hallelujah. So you see, I want you to know that we have all been called. We have all been called. You must understand the reason why you are on earth. There's a reason you are here. Which course are you reading? Political studies. Political studies. 
Hallelujah. You see, your whole existence is for Jesus. Even your course is for Jesus. In fact, even your eating is for Jesus. I know someone will say, I'm going to eat to glorify God. <laughs> when I was young, I found a scripture, Ecclesiastes 2.25. Solomon said, who can eat or enjoy more than I? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, do you see something in this verse? In verse 11, the Bible said he gave some apostles and some prophets and some pastors and some evangelists and some teachers. Evangelists, pastors and teachers. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. I want you to say, I am perfected for the work of the ministry. When you read it in other versions, you wouldn't see any comma after the saint. You wouldn't see any comma. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's how it is read. In the literal translation, it is for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. The fivefold ministry is to perfect the saints so that the saints will do the work of the ministry. So which people are doing the work of the ministry here? The saints. The duty of the, the bounden duty of the fivefold ministry is to equip, to perfect the saints for the saints to do the work of the ministry. So, do I have any saints in the house? Yeah, if you are a saint, then you are for the work of the ministry. If you are not doing the work of the ministry, it means you have not even been perfected. We have the apostle. Now, in the, in the New Testament, we have three categories of giftings, and I'm going to explain them briefly, especially the middle one. Three categories of giftings. We have the spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians 12. The spiritual gift, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then we have the gift of ministry. The ministerial gift. Gift of ministry in Romans chapter 12. Then in Ephesians 4 verse 11 as we read, we have offices. These gifts are offices. You see, these gifts are offices. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, they are in offices. You see? And their duty is to perfect the saints for them to do the work of the ministry. So it's the saints have ministries. So we have the offices, we have ministries. Then we have gifts. Gifts, which are also used, employed by the ministry for service. Hallelujah. So there are those, those in the five-fold ministries are in offices. And there are those who are in ministries. Because they have gifts. And they use the fundamental gift as a means for the execution of their ministry. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So my duty tonight is to perfect you so that you will do the work of the ministry. Now, most of the times in the Greek, when the New Testament used the word perfect or perfecting, the word that is normally used is the word teleosis. Teleosis. But this time around, Paul didn't use the word teleosis for the word perfecting. He used an, another word. And the word is katatismos. Katatismos. You see? For the katatismos of the saint. Katatismos of the saint. Katatismos. Now, the word katatismos, according to classical Greek, is a medical term, which means to recover a dislocated bone or to restore a dislocated bone. Assuming that one of your bones is dislocated, how will you stand and how will you walk? Can you demonstrate it for us? <laughs> it's difficult. But how will you feel if your bones are dislocated? Is there any of you who have experienced a dislocated bone before? Let me see by hand. How, how was it? 
Now listen. So the role of the fivefold ministries or the fivefold offices is to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. That is to say that whoever is not doing the work of the ministry is a dislocated bone in the body of Christ. Whoever is not working for the Lord is a dislocated bone. You are in the body all right, but you are displaced and misplaced. And you are dislocated. Beloved, that's how deadly it is. That's how deadly your situation is. In fact, that is how dangerous your situation is. But thank God, there is good news for you. We are here to restore you to your proper position. Your proper alignment. The second meaning of this word is when Jesus met John, the Bible says that they were, they were fishers. Of, they were fishers. They were fishermen. And the Bible said that when he met John, John was mending the net. Peter was a fisherman and John was a mender of net. You see, the word to mend the net is the word catatismos. You see, look at how the fish net is. If some of the, the nets, some of the, how do you call them? Some of the network, some of the, is it the rope or what they used to? If there's a disconnection and there's no network, and if we try to use them to catch fishes, what will happen? The fish would, fishes will escape. In fact, in those days, there was a, a fish net they used to catch fish. The biggest of them was called a sagane. It was so strong, it took 60 men to draw the sagane from the sea. Because when it is cast into the sea, in one day, it can have two and a half tons of fishes. And if the net is not properly repaired and strong enough, the fishes will escape. You see, the whole ministry program is like a fish net. But the reason why we are not able to have bumper harvest is because some of you are dislocated. So there's like breakages in the net, in the gospel net. So we cannot, we cannot win the lost for Jesus. We cannot have the great harvest for Jesus because they are breakages. And some of them, the, the ends are not meeting. They are dislocated. You have no idea what you would have done for the kingdom if it were effective. I'm telling you, you have no idea what your ministry would have done to the body. If you are serious, on the last day, Jesus will say, thank you, my son. Jesus will say, thank you. Hallelujah. You have no idea. You are so important. Your ministry may not be rec- recognized by men. It doesn't matter. Heaven is taking note of it. It doesn't matter whether men know you or not. It doesn't, we, are, we, are, we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. This is not where we belong. This is not where. Our glory is not in this world. Our glory is in the hereafter. Imagine Billy Graham was not saved. You know how Billy Graham was saved? A certain man did a crusade. A whole field. It's a basketball stadium or something like that. The man fasted for four months into the program. Used his whole entire life savings for the crusade. Prepared well and preached all his intestines out. And when he made the altar call, no one was coming. Sometimes after you have preached and you are on the fire, and the fire is burning and you are making an altar call, no one is coming. You almost look like a failure. So all that I preach, my word is not even powerful enough to convict any sinner. And for 15 minutes, he was calling for sinners to come and receive Christ, and no one was minding him. And after 15 minutes, if we're experienced, you begin to sweat. 20 minutes, no one was coming. And he was using all the scriptures to convince. Then a 16 year old boy just came forward. The way he was coming, so I see he, we don't, he wasn't even sure whether the guy was even sure. And the guy gave his life to Christ. He left the meeting feeling that he, was, he had failed. But that guy is Billy Graham, was Billy Graham. According to human history, no one has reached men face to face in evangelism like Billy Graham. The man has labored in the gospel. His converts are people like Jesse Duplantis, Ray Bolt, Jerry Savelle, a whole, a lot of the ministers God is using, they are all the converts of Billy Graham. But there is a Billy, more than Billy Graham in this house. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 verse 13 And make straight path for your feet 
lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather, but let it rather be healed, and make straight path for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. The word turned out of the way actually is out of joint. Other versions will use the word out of joint. And that's a Greek word actually. Lest that which is lame be out of joint. According to Paul's interpretation, what Paul is saying is that there are some people in the body who are out of joint. There are some believers in the body of Christ who are out of joint. And as long as you are out of joint, the body will never come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We need you. The truth is that we need you to take your place before Christ can come. The thing is that the reason why Christ has not come is because of you. Because I'm doing my best, but you are not doing your best. Haven't you read Ephesians 4.15? It says that, and speaking the truth in love will grow up into him in all things, which is the head, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase unto the edifying of itself in love. If we are properly connected to the joint, and the joint is supplying, and the whole body is properly framed, that is when the body can be nourished in love. Don't be out of joint. Now, to be out of joint, the scripture we read, let's go back to Hebrews, to be out of joint, most script, the versions will say out of joint. To be out of, out of joints means to be dislocated. In another term, it means to be turned out of the way. If you are not fulfilling your ministry, you are turned out of the way. You are out of the will of God. You are outside the will of God. You are displaced and misplaced. You are lost on God's calendar. But tonight you are here to be found. <laughs> and make straight path for your feet. Lest that which is lame. Actually, the believers who are not effective with God and not fulfilling their function, Paul is saying that they are lame. If you fulfill your ministry, you are lame. You can't walk. Have you seen a lame person putting on shoes before? How can your feet be showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Because in the Bible, shoes stand for assignment and purpose. John the Baptist said, the latchet of whose shoes, I am not ready to stoop down to untie. That means I can't touch Jesus' assignment. He is higher and greater. So, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings of good, that publish it peace, and that see it unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Let me see whether your feet are beautiful. Your feet must be beautiful. Going forth with the gospel. Standing in the firm foundation of the gospel of peace. But if you are lame, that means you have no, you have no use and service to God. If you are lame, that means you are turned out of the way, dislocated and disjointed out of joint, displaced and misplaced in the will of God. But I pray that the divine revelation of God will dawn, dawn upon you. And by means of revelation, you take your part as a living, visceral member of the body that the body may as be edified. But how do you know your ministry? I can't tell. But I'll help you. Because most of the times when we say ministry, what comes to mind is that, ah, for me, I'm not called as an apostle. What can I do? I'm not even a prophet. Even dreams. Seeing dreams is a problem for me. <laughs> evangelist. Oh, I'm for me, evangelist, dear. Pastor. Ah, pastor. Teacher. No, 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 no. Even my quiet time, I'm not consistent with my quiet time. Teacher. You ask yourself, so what? I'm not. Pa-. So there are many people who think that when we speak of ministry, we are speaking about these five things. That's not it at all. These are the offices that God has given us. To help us enter our ministry. So I've showed you that there are the gifts, there are the ministries, and there are the offices. We must locate our ministry. And if we're able to locate your ministry, you can grow in the ministry. And some of you can grow in your ministry until you enter into the office. Romans chapter 12. Let's read from verse 4. As we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Haven't then gifts different? According to the grace that is given unto us. Now, in this verse, from this verse going, we see what is called ministry gift. And Paul teaches us some of the things he, he has atomized as ministry gift. 
And I want to go through quickly because you may find your pl- yourself, you, you may find your place in these ministries. This is different from Ephesians 4.11. And it's different from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the first thing he mentioned is prophecy. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now there's the ministry of prophesying, which is different from having the gift of prophecy. And which is different from being a prophet. In 1 Corinthians 12, we have the gift of prophecy. The simple gift of prophecy. In Romans 12, verse 6, we have the ministry of prophesying. Then in Ephesians 4.11, we have the prophet. The office of the prophet. The three are different. Now, some of you have the gift of prophecy. Where? In the, in the New Testament, prophesying, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14.2, that when we prophesy, we prophesy unto exhortation, edification, and comfort. That means that when you are prophesying, it must edify someone. It must comfort someone. It must exhort someone. To exhort means to stir up someone. To comfort means to cheer up someone. To edify means to build up someone. That's the nature of the gift of prophecy. Normally when we say prophecy, we think of saying things in the future. Things concerning the future is actually the operation of the word of wisdom. It's the gift of the word of wisdom. But the gift of the word of wisdom uses the vehicle of prophecy as its manifestation. You see, so to prophesy means to bubble forth like a fountain. Prophecy has two wings, to foretell and to foretell. In the Old Testament, prophecy was foretelling because they used the word of wisdom to speak into the future. In the New Testament, prophesying is primarily foretelling, speaking for the mind of God, speaking for exhorting, comforting, cheering up. That is the simple gift of prophecy. But there are those who have gone further and have prophecy has become their ministry. Prophesying is their ministry. For them, it has become a regular feature in their life and ministry. Some of them have gone a little beyond exhortation, edification and comfort. They've gone into the operation of the word of wisdom as well, into directives and predictives. But their ministry primarily is that they prophesy to exhort people to stir up people. And we don't see a lot in the church today. We see glimpses. And this kind of prophesying, the more as you grow in faith, the more that kind of gift of prophesying grows. Where you meet, you can prophesy people, not just in the foretelling, because its primary function is the foretelling. Especially those who have been able to develop or have been able to receive the gift of the interpretation of tongues. Tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. That's what is in 1 Corinthians 14. It's their ministry. I have someone, a friend like that, who will speak in tongues right now. He will just know what God is saying to you. Then he will edify you with the tongues. He will interpret what he said. And some of you, in your own prayer life, each will have been praying in tongues very well. Each will have been schooled in the school of tongueology. Paul said, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. The gift of diverse speaking of tongues. You speak. You come to a place where you speak and you interpret. You speak and you interpret. It can become a personal gift or a public gift. You speak and you interpret. If you pray very well, you get to a certain place, you speak. There were times I pray and I speak in tongues and my tongues comes in English. Then it switches back to tongues. Don't think I'm a special person. It's not true. I refuse to receive the lie of the devil. I'm not saying you are devils. But you can do it. Hallelujah. The ministry of prophesying. Exhorting others. Then you can also speak the future concerning them. And the end result is to raise them up. To stir them up. To cause them to draw close to Jesus. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If it is a real prophecy, we see the testimony of Jesus. Jesus must be testified in the prophesying. The prophecy must reveal Jesus. Let us wait on our ministry. There is a ministry of ministry. This kind of ministry is called the ministry of service or the ministry of a servant. It is the ministry of ministry, the ministry of service, the ministry of a servant. But the Greek said 
the ministry of a deacon. Actually, the word deacon is the ministry of service or the ministry of a servant. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it is called the ministry of helps. Some of these ministries speak see to the day-to-day physical task of the ministry. For instance, look at all these speakers. How did all these speakers come here? How did all these instruments come here? It didn't come by prophesying. It came by the ministry of ministry. Who are those who, let me see my hands, those who brought this. In fact, your ministry is ministry. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's the ministry of helps. How were all these chairs arranged here? The ministry of helps. Look at the light. Look at the room. The place is well swept. The ministry of helps. The ministry of service. And then let me tell you, Stephen in the Bible was in this kind of ministry. Don't think this ministry there is low power. How is it low? Stephen was in this kind of ministry. Stephen. Philip was in this kind of ministry. Romans 16.1, Phoebe. Phoebe was in this kind of ministry. The Bible said he was a servant of the church that was in St. Crea. The word servant actually is the same word in Greek here. He was in the ministry of helps. And he takes diverse shapes and diverse forms, actually. Some of you ashes can be in that ministry. So many examples fall under that category. This ministry. Help. Without them, the ministry cannot run. Without them, the ministry cannot move on. So you may have, you may have been called to help the ministry in some way, somehow. Holy Ghost will place it in your heart. You feel burdened. You have passion for that kind of ministry. Your heart is like... Anytime you come to, the, to, the, to, to this where we meet or where you meet for church service, you seem to perceive a certain kind of need. Others may be talking about something else, but for you alone, yeah, this sound, this, this, this microphone, this place, this, this car, I mean, why are those who have been driving the ISCF, the CCF, the, those cars? You are in the ministry of ministry. You are in the ministry of helps. Or he that teaches, on teaching. The one who is teaching, let him go on teaching. Now, this ministry of teaching is different from the office of a teacher. Ephesians 4 verse 11 speaks of the one who is the office of a teacher. It's different from this one. Every believer must be able to teach. But there are those who have the ministry of teaching and those office of a teacher. For when for the time ye ought to have been teachers, he was speaking to the whole church. He have need that, that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is a babe, and unskillful in the word of righteousness. But strong meat belongeth unto them that are f- full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So actually, every believer must be able to teach fundamentally the word of God. But there are those who have gone further so that teaching has become their ministry. There is no way you can step into the office of a teacher if you don't first have the ministry of teaching. By the time you are in the office of a teacher, you are raising teachers. Someone like Aquila and Priscilla, they were in this kind of office. People with the ministry of teaching, you realize they are very skilled in the local church. They teach the local church. Aquila and Priscilla, they instruct the local church. They teach the, they teach the local church. But those who are in the office of a teacher, they do more of teaching the universal church. So you love the word of God, but you can develop it. As you spend more time in the word, before you realize, teaching is becoming your ministry. It's becoming your ministry. It's becoming your ministry. It's becoming your ministry. You are growing in it. It's becoming your ministry. And as you grow, before you realize, it has become your office. Now you are raising teachers. The next one. He that exhorteth. This one is very vast. The ministry of exhortation. A lot of ministries are hidden under this ministry. Some have called this ministry the Barnabas ministry. Barnabas was a son of consolation. Some have called this ministry the ministry of encouragement. The Barnabas ministry. Everyone was afraid of Saul, Saul who became Paul. It was Barnabas who could take Paul's hands and take him to the apostles. Now, there's a difference between teaching and preaching. Preaching proclaims, teaching explains. To, to preach is to proclaim, to teach is to explain. Those who have the gift of preaching, preach, they are under the gift of exhortation. 
this is a very wide, huge gift that has different kind of manifestations. Preaching is under exhortation. There are some people who want to give them the microphone, no matter what. Well, they, will just, they will preach. And they have developed it. Someone like Bishop T.D. Jakes. There are some people when they are preaching, you, don't, you wonder what they are thinking before they are saying it. Or the Holy Ghost is just using the word, they are just bringing the word out. Strange anointings. There was a conference, um, IJOC, at Hashem Law's conference. And at that conference, Dr. Menso Tabu was sitting down, Bishop T.D. Bismarck was sitting down, T.D. Jakes was sitting down, all the, I mean, those fathers were sitting down. And T.D. Jakes preached. Then, Bishop Tito Bismarck also had to preach. When he took the microphone, he said, preaching in the presence of T.D. Jakes is like, I feel like a nurse in the midst of a doctor, in the, midst of a, in, in the presence of a doctor. And when Dr. Menso Table took the microphone, you know what he said? He said, I think that these people are su- superhuman. How can T.D. Jakes just have one verse, use one verse to preach for two hours? And can you imagine, Dr. Menso Table was wondering, he just used one verse to preach for two hours. And it's like, he's speaking, and people are standing, and they are raising their hands. You know what he said? He said, this is what Dr. Mesut Tabel said. He said, when I'm preaching and someone raises their hands, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like the word is, 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 is I'm losing the word. I don't know what is really happening. But when it comes to TDJs, the more you raise your hands, the more he is there. <laughs> because he's an exhorter, actually. Now, singing ministry, where does it fall? The ministry of singing falls under both prophesying and exhortation. In the Old Testament, a lot of the prophesying was done by First Chronicles 25, verse 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph, of Haman, and of Jeduthun, who should prophesy with the harps. Can you imagine? They prophesy with the harps, with the psalteries, with the cymbals. David could take the harp and David would play. And, you know, David was playing and singing. He said, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cannon, and let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. That means, let me never be able to sing, and let me never be able to play. Singing and playing were together. They sang as they played, and they played and they prophesied. In the tabernacle of David, which is different from the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of David, the tabernacle of David was a tent. And, you know, that tabernacle had no veil. David had 24 courses of priesthood and Levites who worshipped God 24 hours a day when were near courses. And they stood before the Ark of the Covenant and there was no veil. So it was eye contact. And they saw the wings of the cherubims. And there was someone sitting by the side of the, within the temple. And as the Levite, as Haman and Asaph, as they were worshipping God, all of a sudden they began to prophesy through songs. They are singing yet the song is prophesying. And they began to play. And there's something called Temple Psalm, Psalm Modi. Someone is sitting by the side, and as he's prophesying through the singing, the person is writing. And that's how the book of Psalms was written. <laughs> David could play the harp. An evil spirit would be tormenting Saul. And David would play it. And the Bible said all of a sudden, Saul was exorcised from the evil spirit. The Bible said that Saul's, well, Saul was made well. In the Hebrew, the word made well means Saul was revived. And refreshed. So his playing and singing could bring revival and refreshing. And could bring deliverances and cast out devils. Beloved, you should be able to sing to cast out devils from the, from the bodies of people. So singing is a very serious ministry. You can't just be there. You are coming to sing and you eat banquet and tilapia. You are so full. Listen. If you are ministering, you have to check. You can eat all that you want. Maybe the day before the ministry. Or maybe in the morning or in the afternoon. But when it's getting closer to your ministration, you shouldn't eat like that. If you eat like that and you are so full, you have imprisoned your spirit. You cannot release it. You merely sing, but it will not be prophesying. But if you come to sing and before you are coming, your spirit has its dominion over your body and over your soul and your spirit has a preeminence. And you have beat under your body and brought it under subjection. And whilst you are coming, you are full of koraba, steka talai, thrash kanama suketaka, yeko zikanele batalaka, thrash at, you are, you are fired, building up yourself on your most holy feet. 
praying in the Holy Ghost, you are edifying yourself, stirring up yourself, igniting your inward embers. You are full of fire. I'm telling you, your singing brings result. People are delivered from spirit. Sicknesses are healed. Diseases are healed. When you are singing, you shouldn't say, I'm part of the, I'm part of the choir. I'm just coming. No. It should be your ministry. Ministry of prophesying and exhortation. Even in prophecy, you prophesy unto exhortation because you stir the people up and draw them close to God. It's a kind of prophesying. And when you are, you should have a goal when you stand here. You should have an expectation. When footballers are playing on the field, they can dribble and dribble, but the end of the dribbling is that it should enter into the goalpost. What is the use of dribbling without the ball entering the goalpost? In fact, the reason why we are on the field is that the ball will enter into their goalpost. Even if we don't dribble and at the end of the day the ball enters their goalpost, we are fulfilled. Players on the field are there for an, like, with an agenda. It must enter the goalpost. When you stand here, you don't just come here to entertain people. You are here with an agenda. With a focus, with an aim. You are singing to their spirit. If you sing from the spirit, you, you will reach their spirit. If you sing just from your mind, you only reach their head. But the life of God and rivers of living waters flows from the spirit. So if we're able to ignite, ignite and release your spirit, God's refreshing brooks and the living waters will flow out of your spirit and many shall be healed and revived. That should be your ministry. Prepare. Know that it's your ministry. Put your heart into it. Your whole being into it. Knowing that you will give account on the last day and make it special. Hallelujah. Another branch of the ministry of exhortation. Do you, know, do you know that prayer is a ministry? Now, exhortation is the Greek word to, to draw nigh. It's like the drawing nigh of a priest. It's like a priest drawing nigh to God. The word exhortation in the Greek. You see, there are those with the ministry of prayer, and their ministry stirs up people through their intercessions and supplications. They draw people to God by their ministry. They have a priestly ministry of drawing people to God through their prayer, like Epiphras. People were praying, but Epiphras is one was special. Epiphras is one of you. He's a servant of the Lord, and he salutes you. And Paul says that always laboring. He was not praying, no. Always laboring. Kolabasha. Fervently. He was laboring fervently in prayer that you will stand perfect and complete in all, in all, in all of the will of God. And Paul said, For I bring him record. I may wait to him, his prayer life. I bear him record that he has a great, a great zeal for you and for them that are at Laodicea and for those at Herapolis. He was praying for Coloss- the Colossian church, for the Laodicean church, and for Herapolis. I bear him record that he has great zeal. The guy was praying at the whole church. He was laboring in prayer. That of laboring always. Laboring always. Not sometimes. Always. Bringing the whole church into the conformity of the will of God. Prayer is a ministry. In the Old Testament, we call that the ministry of remembrances. The ministry of remembrances. You can find that in the book of Isaiah chapter 62, verse 6. Let's go to Isaiah 62, verse 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace. Day nor night, ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Ye that make now the word ye that make mention of the Lord, the Hebrew is the word ye remembrances. Some of the old versions we use the word remembrances. Ye remembrances. <laughs> May God give you the ministry of a remembrancer. You know those people. And as after the three verse twenty six, put me into remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Remembrances. That means that for them. There was a man by name Charles Grandison Finney. He was one of the fathers of the age of revival. And this man's ministry was so unique because the man was on a horseback and he won 500,000 souls for Jesus. Just on a horseback. And when he ministers, he had remarkable results. After Finney, when it comes to passion for souls, Finney, if Charles Finney goes to town without preaching the gospel, he comes into his room and weeps and tells the Lord he's sorry because he went to town without making any saving impression. And when he preaches and he doesn't see souls saved, 
he comes to his room so that he will use prayer to win what he lost. During his days, the presence of God was so tangible. There are times Charles Finney could just come and stand like this. People will see him and that's all. They weep, they weep, they will confess Christ, and they will repent, and they will just be weeping without even saying a word. He entered a factory, not even a church, and the whole factory started weeping. Just entered the factory, the whole factory. Ah, ah, people, they wept ah, from the manager to the last person. They wept. And when he takes one step, ah, ah, they'll start groaning. Please don't come, don't come, don't come. Stay where you are. Everybody gave his life to Christ just by his presence. And wherever he goes, there were revivals. And people wondered why. What was his secret? Because people were praying and nothing was happening. And you know what? When he was interviewed, you know what he said? He said, I have learned to plead the promises of God. Finney was praying with the scriptures. Remembrances. They put God into remembrance. As I said, put me into remembrance. That's what God was saying. Let us plead together. The Hebrew said, plead your case as a lawyer. You know how lawyers plead their case? To, to plead your case, you must be well endowed. You must, your pact must be intact. And God is saying that the word let us plead together actually means plead your case as a lawyer. Don't just go and pray. Before you pray, like George Muller, he opened the Bible and said, God, this is what you said. God, come. And he will quote God what he said. Are you not the one who said this? And put, because God, the Bible said that God cannot deny himself. If he can deny his word, it means he's denying himself. And his integrity backs his word. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it and will he not, will he not do it? Has he spoken and shall he not make it good? God has spoken once, twice have I heard that power belongeth unto God. I said in my haste, all men are liars. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing which has, has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn in my holiness, I will not lie unto David. You see, God cannot lie by two Im- 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 immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Now, take God's word. Didn't you say this, 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 and that? you plead your case like a lawyer? You pray, you plead your case. I'm telling you, God cannot escape. Now, if I believe God for something and it seems not to work, take the scriptures and hold God. That is apostolic governmental intercession. Look at Abraham. Abraham was the first person to intercede in the Bible. So, if you want to learn about intercession, the law of first mention, go to Abraham. The principle is there. He wasn't saying, he wasn't crying and begging God, God, please, please. Shall the judge of the earth not do right? So the prayer of Epiphras, you know, Jesus told Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift thee as sweet, but I have prayed for you. Not I will pray for you, I already prayed for you. And when that was converted, strengthen the brethren. That is a ministry of exhortation. Your prayer is to raise up men, to stir them up and to encourage them. That kind of prayer, the ministry of prayer, when it comes upon you, I've experienced that before. There was a man by the name John Hyde, who was nicknamed Praying Hyde. He, he was called Praying Hyde. He prayed until he died in prayer. He prayed and prayed. Now, the guy prayed so much that they took him to the hospital. Then they realized that his heart had shifted because of praying. And a doctor advised him not to, to, read, not to pray. According to history, because of the doctor's advice, he missed one night. The next night he said he couldn't. The burdens were too much. So he went to pray again because he was praying for one person to be converted. He prayed until he died in prayer. When the passion and the burden of prayer comes upon you, O Tanaman Dolimaha, pastors are praying for 20 minutes and 30 minutes. When that kind of ministry gift hits you, 